welcome all of you again to the final opportunity that we have for having a discussion within this particular course. So this is session 12 discussion and I'm here with Katie and it's probably apropos that we finish this, this course off in this way. We've got two topics that we'd like to talk about that have arisen as a result of conversations that we've had with some of you. And we won't mention any names or anything, but uh, you can probably recognize yourself as we go along. But we'd like to talk about aha moments and how uh, the cognitive learning processes are actually involved in those kinds of pieces, because we have noticed a number of aha moments with many of you as we were going through the latter portions of this course. And then we want to talk about the role of community, so the learning community, and how that in is involved in presentations, et cetera. A couple of comments that we'd like to make there. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie to have a, a start at the aha moments and everything that's involved. Maybe what you can do is start off with some of your own experiences within PBL and then relate that to some of the experiences that you've been noticing uh, with some of the other students as they were going through their own aha moments. Thanks, Merlin. You know, I guess the first thing I'm going to start off by saying is that not everybody's aha moment is the same. Uh, it doesn't happen at the same time, and it doesn't happen in the same way. So I know that uh, for the students out there that are saying, I still want my aha moment, don't worry. You you may have had it, and, and it may still be coming. For me, you know, I, I've talked in this course um, about my aha moment when I first took the PBL course, um, and it happened for me uh, around the final weeks. So maybe I'm a, a slow learner, or maybe I was right on time. But um, for me, it happened after the frustrating moments, which I have also expressed. Um, and there seems to be kind of a, a process that occurs um, for all of us uh, where we start off really excited and then really frustrated. But uh, yeah, so you start off really excited and then a little bit frustrated. And for me, it was more than a little bit. And, um, and then there was this breakthrough that occurs um, for some of us. And for me, that happened near the end where I started to realize that maybe my old way of learning, my old, outdated way, um, maybe wasn't the only way or the best way, um, and it all started to fall into place for me. And I know that uh, from talking with some of the other students, they've discussed this ongoing learning and that this um, aha hasn't necessarily occurred or, or um, they're still waiting for it to occur. But, um, you know, I can really relate to their process because for PBL with me, um, you know, after I left my, my B. Ed. PBL course a few years ago, I found myself reflecting on it over and over again um, in just about everything I did and every new course that I took. And it, it was almost like it changed my way of thinking about the world, um, not just my way of teaching, but the way that I learned, the way that I taught, the way that I viewed things. And so um, when I went off into the grade two land, um, I started trying it on a small level. And as I became more comfortable as a teacher with problem and, and project, because um, that's initially where I started, um, I became more comfortable uh, with the grade twos problem and problem solving and problem based learning. Um, and then I started with my grade nines and my grade tens, and then now at the college level. And I find myself years later um, in constant reflection um, and analysis of the process, trying it out, um, thinking back to my own process, and it's just consistent learning, constant learning. It's a cycle for me. Um, I'm having little aha moments all the time, and, and it just hasn't stopped for me. So I know that some of our students, or I'm hoping some of our students, are going to leave this course and continue this process, continue the things that they are um, learning and their, their new thinking patterns um, and thinking processes, and they're going to go out and they're going to realize more and more um, from the foundation of this course, how much it has affected them. I, I was thinking when you were talking there, Katie, that this actually re responds quite nicely to some of the ideas that I, I have very briefly touched on within the course. And I'm just going to one more time uh, bring up uh, Roger's diffusion of innovation at this point, um, because I think it's it's fairly appropriate to uh, to, to think about what's going on here. So it's Roger's diffusion of innovation. If you take a look at it in Wikipedia, you'll come across the major idea, um, the whole idea that there are going to be a, um, a, there's quite a spread in terms of the re kinds of response that you'll get to 
the introduction of an innovation into any new area. And so in this particular um, course, we're actually talking about the introduction of PBL as a means of um, taking a look at ideas around education and uh, digital technologies that have application to, uh, to education, <clears throat> which is an, uh, an innovation by itself. So some people in the course would have been um, early adopters of uh, these change changes. Uh, some will be the early majority. So in other words, they're a little bit further behind in terms of the uh, adoption of the ideas that were involved um, than the majority of the, uh, the population are in the late majority. Then there's a few laggards. And I'm not sure if there are any of those in this course. I, I really don't think so. And on the far end, you'll actually find that there are some individuals who would probably be classified as resistors, uh, which is why I was needling uh, Katie just a little bit about uh, being a resistor. The idea about the adoption of an innovation, though, for each individual is that you, you've got to think about a, uh, a process that's going along. Then you get introduced to a new idea. And there's not going to be initially a huge change in most people's part. In fact, they'll find that there's going to be a dip in their performance, a dip in their understanding. And, and that's what uh, Katie was talking about in terms of the frustration kind of piece that uh, a lot of you have experienced uh, fairly early on in the course for the mo most of you. Um, and then you will find that your performance or understanding goes up and perhaps it goes up higher than what you had before. So it's it's that dip piece that really becomes an important consideration to acknowledge, um, to note when it's actually happening with you, and uh, to also notice when changes start to occur with your thinking. And that that's what we have uh, identified as being the, uh, the aha moment, where things start to fall into place for you. Some of you may have found that that happened early on in the course. Some of you may have found, and we were noticing it uh, typically around week eight, week nine, week 10, somewhere in there for several of you. But don't worry, for some of you who haven't had the aha moment, it, it may be that you're just an innovator or an early adopter, and therefore you've already gone through those kinds of stages. Or it might be that uh, in the next course, in the new year, that you will be uh, confronted with some of these ideas and you have to come to, to grips with it um, and change the paradigm that you're actually having within your own thought structure. Having said that, I think we've spent enough time on it and I do definitely want to get to this second question. So the role of community during presentations. And maybe Katie, what you can do is start uh, with a, a generic kind of description about what we've been seeing in the presentations and then just describing that uh, back to the whole piece that uh, we talked about with Longino and their four responsibilities, really, uh, that all of us have uh, during the presentation and how that should start to take effect um, as we move into next week's anyways. So you want to start, Katie? Perfect. Um, you know, at this point, I'm hoping that everybody's going, Longino, who, what, wait, what was that? And, uh, and hopefully when uh, you go back to reflect on this course, you're going to look at that because I feel like we maybe skimmed that a little too quickly in our beginning um, because what I've been seeing with our community of learners is a little too much positive feedback. Um, maybe it's a Canadian thing. I don't know. Maybe we're all a little too polite. Maybe I should have been tougher so you guys would have been forced to be tougher to me. But um, I, I'm noticing that we are really supportive as a group and that's really um, great in a way. Um, but, in, but in this class, um, it's really crucial that we um, challenge our ideas and our, um, and our concepts. And um, not just important for the, the TA or the professor to be challenging the students, but for the students to be challenging the students. And I found that uh, as I was observing the presentations, um, the feedback tended to be superficial. Um, and I've spoken to a few students about um, this because I... I was trying to push for, for a deeper understanding um, instead of going, you know, when my grade twos present, I tell them to make eye contact or to speak louder um, or to slow down. But I would imagine that by the time that we're adults, that we've gotten, uh, well, those are still very crucial to presenting. Um, there are more important things to be critiquing um, during a presentation in that um, should we be focusing, Roland, on the 
medium of the presentation or should we be focusing on the message? Um, and in my eyes, um, the message is where we should be focusing our critiquing um, at this point to help further our thinking. What are your thoughts? Of course, the interesting thing there is that uh, if you're a believer in Marshall McLuhan, uh, he said that the medium is the message. So the content has everything to do with the way that you're actually presenting it. Anyhow, putting that aside for the time being, um, one of the things that I, I, I think is really, really important here is that there needs to be a challenge on the part of the peers who are participating in the, particip in the presentation. Notice the terminology that I'm using. A presentation is not something that you have done to you. You are part of the presentation, even if you are not the person who is giving the presentation or the person who prepared the presentation. You are still bound by regulations or rules or responsibilities is probably a better way of looking at it. And those responsibilities have to do with making sure that you are engaged with the, the ideas making sure that you come up with questions that ask for clarification. And if you do not agree with uh, the ideas that are being presented, then it is your responsibility to ensure that that disagreement is brought to the foreground. That is part of what being a community is all about. A community is not a bunch of people who stand around and say, yeah, go. Anything is acceptable. Everything is is uh, permissible, and we we just won't have any disagreement whatsoever. It is uh, the responsibility of all of us to come up with not only those disagreements, but also to make sure that they are in front of us, so that we can act on them. We need to be able to have the ideas that are different from our own uh, presented to us so that it causes us to do some thinking about those differences. And then somewhere along the line, we will need to negotiate our shared understandings between those. That's part of Vygotsky's uh, social constructivist kinds of uh, ideals as well. So if you only have the presentation and idea and you're not act actively engaging with it, there is no possibility of creating a community. It's a sham. It's a, it's a um, a bunch of people who look like they're in community, but they really aren't. A community means that you get down and dirty. You need to get your fingernails into the, into the dirt um, and talk about things. Now, you can still do that on a very collegial, on a very polite, using the terminology that uh, Katie was using, um, level. We need to be able to actually talk about the differences uh, because it's only in those differences that we actually end up with new understandings. If everybody says everything's okay and everything's permissible, we're never going to change anything because it's not having any traction. It's not getting any action. It's not causing us to uh, respond to them. Final words, Katie? Well, I was just going to tie it into this whole cooperating and collaborating, this idea that cooperating, you find a way to have your own peace in that puzzle, but collaborating, you need to create new pieces together. And so hopefully you'll take away from that the value of collaboration over cooperation um, as you move forward in your courses next semester. Sounds good. Thank you very much for your efforts uh, in, in terms of TAing this course. I hope that it's been a, uh, a worthwhile experience for you, a learning experience, um, something that you're going to be able to take along with you into the new courses in the uh, next term as well. And I'd like to thank all of the students for uh, going through this first semester. I know we've had some uh, rough parts as we're starting off this new program, but um, I'm getting the impression based on the feedback that I've seen um, in response to the survey questions, et cetera, that people are very, very happy with where we're going. And in conversation, I hope to, uh, um, I, I've noted that myself. I hope that we're going to have more and more of those uh, opportunities for not only the aha, but uh, opportunities for sharing of ideas and uh, disagreements and all those kinds of things so that we can all build new knowledge as we move forward. So thank you again, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.